Hey there. Welcome to another episode of Tinnitus TV. Today I am talking to Matt Stubbs of GA20. You know, the Blues have already been pretty good to Matt Stubbs for a while now, but lately they've been even better. For more than a decade, the Boston guitarist has been touring the world and recording with harmonica master Charlie Musselwhite. But more recently, and more importantly, Stubbs has begun to make his mark with his rapidly rising trio, GA20. Named for a vintage guitar amp, the Bare Bones Crew, which also includes singer-guitarist Pat Faherty and drummer Tim Carmen, deliver rough and ready, vintage-sounding nuggets that are a bit like J.D. McPherson fronting the Black Keys at Buddy Guy's Legends, if that makes sense. On their latest and so far greatest album, Crackdown, they've expanded their sonic horizon somewhat, adding bits of soul, R&B, country, and early rock and roll into their gritty mix. If you haven't heard them yet, now's the time to start. But first, watch as Stubbs talks to me about Life with Muscle White, his most treasured vintage guitar, and why their third album is really their second album, and in a way, their first album. Enjoy. Matt Stubbs, it is a pleasure to meet you. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me today. Thanks for having me. Ah, like I said, my pleasure. So the reason we're talking today is because there is a third GA20 album coming out, Crackdown. But in a way, it's sort of like your first album, isn't it? I mean, the first one was kind of cobbled together and expanded from an EP. And then the second one was all covers, obviously. So this is really the first time that you had this uh, time and ability to sort of craft this, you know, an album all on its own from start to finish in the studio, right? It is, uh, correct. Interesting story. Um, Crackdown actually was recorded before the Hound Dog record. This is officially like the follow-up to Lonely mm -hmm. Soul. We recorded it like, in, you know, months before Hound Dog. What happened was we were getting ready to release it. We had all tour dates booked like most bands. And everything shut down in March and we had this record scheduled to come out in a few months. And, you know, we talked to the label and it seemed like it didn't really make a whole lot of sense to do the follow-up all nine out of 10 original tunes. If we couldn't tour behind it or do proper press, we, I mean, like anyone, we didn't know what was going to happen. So we said, all right, let's put it on hold. And then just organically some opportunities uh, came up and we ended up doing that hound dog tribute record. That, that was also not really a thing that we planned. It just kind of, like I said, Alligator Records had reached out to us about doing something and our label, we were signed up with our label. So we were able to get everybody to work together just because of the conditions where everyone was off the road. Oh, I got you. So it's 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 your third album, but sort of your second album and sort of your first album. It's it's all just, it makes no sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's definitely like you said, the first album when we went in to record songs for Lonely Soul, we weren't sure it was going to be an LP, it was going to be an EP. And then the label wanted it to be an LP, so we went back in. But yeah, this one we had the whole, all, all the songs, all the collection of ten tunes, or actually there's a couple more than ten, but uh, we en ended up with ten before we went in, and it was all it was all done, you know, within the same block of time. Right. So did did that change the way you approached it from the start in terms of uh, thinking of it as an album and how you how you wanted to you know maybe structure it and what kind of songs and uh, pacing and all that, or is it just a matter of Oh, we had a dozen songs and we went in and we cut them. Um, a little bit of both. So we we were, let me think about this. Lonely Soul came out and we were, you know, torn a little bit behind that and doing all the promo for that. But we had, even when we had recorded that song, we already had some of these Crackdown songs written. We were already writing. Um, and usually when we get to a certain amount of songs, I'm like, okay, it's time to start planning a, you know, a recording session. So we did do that. We had a batch of songs. Um, couple didn't make it for that reason like I wanted it to be a front to back album and I wanted it to flow a certain way and all be cohesive so there's some tunes that didn't make it on there um but it was nice yeah yeah we approached it like an album for sure yeah I mean it's kind of interesting too because for a lot of bands you know they're together for years and years and years writing songs and then finally maybe you get to make an album and, and typically you know your best songs go on the first album and the the leftovers go on the second album but sure. it's, it's, it happened a lot faster for you guys in terms of you know, you weren't together that long before you made the first album. So you were still kind of on a roll with the initial songwriting, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All, all these songs, like I said, to me, it's really a follow up to Lonely Soul. I mean, I think it's it's grown. The production is, is a little further along. I think the songs are a little better. 
um, and I produce both. So the production, I feel like I, I didn't want to do something drastically different than Lonely Soul, but I also don't want to make the same record twice. So I, I wanted, there's some other influences that snuck in. We were listening to a lot of country music at the time. We were listening, I always listen to like garage rock and psych rock. So there's a little bit of that on one or two tunes, but again, I wanted it to be a follow-up. So I definitely want it to be like a heavy blues record. So there's a couple, couple songs that are on the edges of, of that, but uh, yeah, I think it's growth from the first one. Definitely. I think uh, in, in some of the press stuff, you, you mentioned that you used some vintage recording techniques, and I'm wondering what those are, what, what kind of things you were sure. doing here. Uh, so for Crackdown and Lonely Soul, we uh, used our engineer, his name's Matt uh, Bowden, and he's a really great uh, engineer all around, but he loves 1950s and 60s, you know, soul and blues. Mm -hmm. So both of those recordings were recorded in the same studio, Q Division, which is just outside of Boston. Um, but the techniques, it's not, you know, he's the engineer, so mic placement and stuff like that, I've learned a lot about it since then, but that was his that was his uh, department. Uh -huh. But mostly it was how we recorded it, where we were all live in a room. We used minimal mics. I didn't, we weren't putting like 10 mics on the drum kit. My guitar amp was a couple of feet away from the drums. So there was no isolation really like a lot of modern records have. It, it was a, it's a performance. Like what you hear, we were in one room together making that. Not a lot of over, there's a couple little overdubs on Crackdown, but the performances are all live in one room. If you isolate any one microphone, you're going to hear, you know, lots of bleed from other things, just like all those records that I love had. And uh, it was definitely not going in and trying to be perfect. You know, I'm not trying to make a perfect pop record where everything is to a click and uh, super squeaky clean. We wanted, there's some mistakes on there. There's, you know, you can hear some, we used all old vintage amps. You can hear amps buzzing, you know, and that I think that the records I listen to, they all have that, you know. So, so you weren't doing uh, 100 takes of these songs to get them just no. right? No, I mean, I think the most uh, the, the more the most picky thing we did, we recorded the instrumental, the title track, Crackdown. We recorded it on the first day um, and listening back the next day, it was pretty uh, safe sounding. It sounded safe, sounded like we were tentative. So we did go back on a different day, the second day or third day and recut it. But that was as fancy as we got as far as doing a lot of takes. Most most of those songs were under five takes on this record, you know, probably two or three. And are, were you recording to tape or, or digital? It was funny, we went in, this, it is digital, but we did go in and we're like, oh, let's go let's go to tape this time around. Because uh, uh, on Lonely Soul, we didn't, uh, it was, I, was, I was all in the box. And we went in and the engineer got this, this uh, tape machine up and running before we got in and then the first day it was just it wasn't working right and it was like we were like eight hours into the session we hadn't played a song yet because it's a stupid tape machine so i just was like forget it you know get rid of it let's just let's just do it do it to pro tools like normal and you know i love tape we've done lots of things to tape uh and it definitely has a sound but i think the more important thing is the performances and just how how you mic it up the amps the sounds of the stuff in the room and the performances you can always dirty it up a little bit later if you have to but we don't usually have to do too much of that because our amps are usually already pretty filthy sounding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of talk uh, of gear in some of your stuff, and you guys are obviously big on on that, on the, and, and the vintage gear, obviously. Um, and I mean, I can totally see how that impacts uh, the sound of everything. Do you think that it impacts the creativity? I mean, could you make this album and or even write these songs? on on you know brand new guitars and brand new amps and brand new drums yeah i think you could i mean i think it colors it probably colors the direction a little bit um for me the the vintage gear as much as it is about tone when you listen back <laughs> it's, it's more about feel uh like the way the the amplifier reacts to the guitar same thing with the guitar the way the neck is the, the wood older wood is typically drier and it's lighter and it, you know resonates a little bit better I mean, when I go, when we go on tour and we're flying in somewhere, like when we go to the UK, we're using all new amps. I mean, we're using their reissue amps, but they're new amps and I'm not flying. Sometimes I bring an old guitar, but a lot of times I'm flying with a, a newer reissue guitar. And I think you can get it done. You know, I think a lot of it's in your hands and in the performance, um, but I do gravitate towards vintage stuff. I mean, A, it's my hobby and B, I don't know. It's just all the records I loved were, were used making that stuff. So I think right. it helped a little bit, you know? 
Are you a big collector of that stuff? I mean, are you always on the hunt for, for something? <laughs> Uh, I go through waves if I'm actually buying because I have so much stuff already. But yeah, I'm a big collector. I spend uh -huh. way too much. I mean, it's a lifelong thing. So yeah, lots of guitars, lots of amps. Yep. So of all the gear you've got, is there a prized possession? Yes. Uh, during COVID, um, one of the worst times probably for this piece of gear to come up because I wasn't making money. <laughs> a friend of mine contacted me and he tracked down a 51 Telecaster. Um, and I'm a huge Telecaster fan. And that's kind of the holy grail. They call them blackguards. They only made them for a few years. Um, and this one's very kind of special. It's when you look at the date on it, it was made in October 1951, which is actually not only the first year of a Telecaster, but the first month they started making them. So this is the one of the first 250 Telecasters ever made. And I was wow. able to, it popped up. I didn't, you know, at first I didn't, it was, it was not here. It was in a different part of the country and I had to buy it without touching it. Um, but I ended up selling, I bought it, and then I had to sell 10 guitars to afford it, <laughs> which I did pretty quickly. I had a bunch of guitars that were pretty cool, but not nearly as cool. So that's my, there's one guitar right now. I mean, I have lots of nice ones, but that one's probably a once in a lifetime. I won't have another guitar like that again. And I, and I guess that one does not go on the road. It, I'll take it some gigs around here, but I'm not flying with it. And it's not, it's not getting thrown in the back of the van on a tour, no. Yeah, no, I remember talking to uh, Mike Campbell once from, from Tom Petty's band, and he had just oh, yeah. bought like some, you know, 59 Les Paul. Less, 59, 59 Les Paul. That one's worth more than this one. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, and it was, it was just yeah. like, yeah, that's, that's not going on the road. It's like you get get replicas built of it to take yep. on the road kind of thing. And he has, <laughs> he's a big uh, Telecaster guy too, early 50s Blackguards. He's got a bunch of, he's got Broadcaster, which is the first, you know, before a Telecaster was called a Broadcaster. Oh, you, you go deep on this stuff. Huh? You're right down the rabbit hole. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love that the, the title cut uh, of the record of Crackdown is that instrumental. It's got that kind of house party feel almost to it. Yeah. You know, was there was there something or somebody you had in mind when you were when you were cutting that? Is it kind of an homage to something? Uh, well, I love instrumental music from the 50s and the 60s. Mm -hmm. Um, I've had bands leading up to GA20. I've always had side projects. I have three records out under my own name that are just right. instrumental 50s and 60s type stuff. So I always try to sneak something on, or, you know, if I have any say in it, I like to write an instrumental and get it on there. Lonely Soul had one and this and then Crackdown, obviously. Um, and, you know, it's that one, it's, it's bluesy, but it's, there's definitely like a soul, kind of like a soul boogaloo mm -hmm. influence there. Um, I forget exactly when I wrote it, but I feel like I wrote it thinking about this record, but also in our set back then. Now we typically do, you know, one big set, like at a festival or at a, at a venue. But when we were coming up, when I was writing this, the, that instrumental, we were playing clubs. So we had to do like three sets in a night. So we needed material to stretch out and, you know, have some songs where Pat could rest his voice if we're doing three one hour sets. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of written in that with that in mind. And then uh, I like the way it came out, you know, it's kind of, like I said, it's like a party, party groove. Yeah, it's great. Uh, I mean, you guys are from Boston. Uh, you spent, uh, what, more than a decade working with, with Charlie Musselwhite, one of the legendary Chicago guys. Yeah. And yet on this album, to me, I hear like just tons and tons of Texas. That happens. I mean, I, we, we the band started because we were really, you know, kind of modeling it after 50 Chicago. But I grew up listening to traditional blues across the board. I love Texas blues. I love West Coast blues. Um, so yeah, there's lots of stuff in there. I mean, like Dry Run, is, that single just recently came out. And that one to me is, it's like kind of like a lazy Lester, Jimmy Reed meets country music, you know, and some people are saying they hear like Louisiana in there because of that. But uh, yeah, there's lots, we didn't, there was no template on this record of like, hey, this has to be Chicago stamped, you know, beginning and end we're just influenced from that music but yeah we like all blues yeah and i'm just amazed that so many of these songs sound like they and not just sound in terms of like the the, the sound on the record but the actual songs themselves could have been written 50 60 70 years ago it's like you're 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 writing from another era completely you know well that's good that means it's probably timeless hopefully but uh most of the songs Pat comes up with most of the lyrics, like the I mean, stories, and most of them, as far as I, I don't go too deep into it with them, but uh, I think most of it has to do with similar topic of, uh, you know, getting burned by a by a lover or something, or, you know, or breakups. Sure. 
stuff like that that I think a lot of people can relate to. But yeah. Do you guys do you guys write in the room together a lot, or is it everybody kind of working on their own and putting the pieces together? We usually both do it independently and come up with a rough sketch of something. Then we do an email with a little demo or an iPhone recording and uh, keep it very loose. Like when we first started the band, I would, I was so used to writing instrumentals and writing everything. I would write the whole composition front to back without lyrics. I'd send it to him and then, you know, that boxed him in to write lyrics to. So now it's really loose. I'll just come up with a riff or I might come up with a hook, like a vocal hook, just like mm -hmm. lyrics, one sentence, like easy on the eyes. I came up with that, send it to him, told him what I was thinking. He wrote the rest. Um, and then once we each sit with it and it seems like it's, if it's going to be worth anything, uh, we'll get together as a trio and we'll have Tim play, you know, put a beat to it and we'll start arranging and seeing how it sounds. And then pretty quickly we try to do it live and, and that within playing a song once or twice live, I can usually make the call if it's worth finishing it up and keep going with it. Or if it's, if it's a dog and we never play it again. And what, what's the percentage on that? Do most of them get through? So far, pretty good. I mean, I think I'm trying uh, ones that actually made it to the recording session that we didn't use. I think there's only been one or two of those. Mm -hmm. So if it gets to uh, if it gets to the studio, usually I think it's pretty good. You know, um, yeah, we're pretty we're pretty I'm, I'm pretty judgmental right up front. So if I don't like the idea up front, I'm like, all right, let's move on. Let's not waste time on this, you know. Uh, OK, and, and there is bass on the album, though, right? No. No, because I mean, some of those lines are really low. Are, are you? Well, I'll tell you a secret. There, on one song, there is a bass guitar, but it's not playing a bass line. I have fuzz on it, and it's almost playing like a saxophone part. But there's no, there's, there is no bass lines on like an electric bass. It's all guitar. Okay. Yeah. okay, so you're just doing a lot of low neck stuff to fill out at the bottom end at, at some uh, point. Yeah. It seems like yeah. most of it. I think, if I remember correctly, on this record, there's only one song where we tune lower than standard tuning. Um, hmm. So everything's in standard. If you just have a guitar tuned in E, you can play any of those songs. And was it was the was the uh, decision to you know just do the three piece with the two guitars, just happenstance of of this is the band we have together and we like it and we don't want to expand on it or, or was there something else behind it? it? It was a mix. It was a I really wanted a band when we started. First of all, when we started, I wasn't thinking we were gonna put out records and go tour and do all this. It was, I found myself with a year off, Charlie Musselwhite was going out with Ben Harper's band. Um, right. And that's, that's my job. So he let us know, hey, this year we won't be on tour. And that was, you know, in 2018, I guess. So I was been with Charlie for years uh, yeah. and I was like, oh man, what am I going to do? I need to make some money. I didn't want to get a job. So Pat and I were friends. So we started the band just to play music that we liked and no one was really doing it around Boston. So I'm like, why don't we just make a Chicago blues style band and play any gig we can get just to make some money and have fun. And also I wanted it to be low stress for me where like I had my instrumental band where most of the people were hired guns. I mean, they were the same players, but it was my band. So you got to make sure everyone's making X amount of money. And if somebody can't do a gig, they're not committed to it. You got to hire someone else and then do all yeah. these rehearsals. My idea was let's keep it as simple as possible. So me and Pat, and for the first year, we just had different drummers fill in, didn't care. And um, and it just made it easier without a bass player. And we were trying to make money. So it was a dream <laughs> to make more money. So that's how it all started. And then once we started writing and figuring out how to do this two guitar thing where you don't really necessarily miss the bass in recordings or live, if it's arranged correctly and learn how to weave, who's playing the low end. And um, it just ended up being, I think, a part of our sound. I'm not saying we'll never, I mean, I can say as I doubt we'll have a bass player, but. You never know. Something could change. Every time we have had bass players sit in, we have lots of very talented uh, friends that play bass and we'll have people sit in. It it never really feels like GA20 once we add bass to it. It feels almost cluttered and um, it's just hard to explain. We just kind of, that's the sound now for some reason. Hmm. Okay. Because because there are a lot of bands that start out as these sort of, you know, strip right. down, bass and drums. Sure. I'm not going to name any names, but I'm sure you can... Yeah. You know, but and then a lot then of them end up them, adding bass, yeah. And then yeah, and then you see them on the next tour, and they've got you know the original duo backed by six guys. You know, right? I know I can think of one band in particular, but um, it could happen. Look, hey, I think it just depends on the songs you're writing. If if it comes to a point where I feel like adding a bass would make a huge difference in in a record or songwriting, and that's a game changer. You never know. You might 
befriend someone who's just this amazing bass player that is going to bring something. Right. I would probably be open to it. Um, but until that happens, I'm totally fine keeping it lean and mean for, for touring and for recording. You know, it's, it's enough. Three, three personalities is already a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we tour nonstop. So just adding people, just usually more people, more problems. Right. Yeah. You know, talking about you just sort of starting this, you know, because you had time to, to, to fill and need to make some money. I mean, it must have been ironically gratifying and just weird that that you know this is is the thing because you've been around you've done a lot of stuff you've been sure. a working musician for for decades now yeah. and that, that this thing you almost started not quite as a lark but you know not with some grand scheme or plan sure. ends up right. being the thing that that totally takes off for you it feels good it's it's interesting because it had it had, if you look at a calendar it isn't kind of fairly short amount of time for a band yeah. to go from like i said playing a little dive bar to being able to tour a lot of it we owe to our we got lucky getting a really good record label coal mine records and as soon as we got that i i was like all right well we could we could we could uh move this into the next level with having a label like that and then the next for us the next missing piece that we did not really have um until covid happened is is a kind of <coughs> excuse me a bigger agency a booking agency mm. we worked with some smaller ones and they were fine but um it wasn't until we got with our agent now his name is michael morris with mint talent that opened a lot of doors because they're doing a lot of business with bigger festivals bigger bands all the venues um and but those two guys combined with what we're doing uh was was able to open a lot of doors for us yeah but it's well, just great too that the, you've got the public acceptance i mean all of those all of those other yeah. business pieces are great yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, because I remember getting, must have been the first single, it landed in my email box one day, and I went, oh, this is great, and, you know, post something about it and send it off, and yeah. and, and thought, well, these guys, you know, this is a great little band, and I hope that they can keep this sure. up, and then it's just been this, yeah. you, know, uh, you know, what you guys do is is definitely sort of, you know, outside the the, the norm in so many ways, it's it's just, right. you know, I don't yeah, know, I don't I know, know question there, it's a, thank you, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a strange spot musically to be in because we're doing traditional blues for sure and air, when we started the band and as we started so many people were like well you just you can do that just don't call it blues don't you know blues has a bad <laughs> reputation you know no one wants to listen to blues and i kind of not kind of i did i went a completely different way i said i'm gonna lean into it i said we're only we're calling this blues like yeah why not? If someone doesn't if someone here hears that and they think it's See, blues right now, the PR problem with blues, I think a lot of people hear blues and they instantly go to thinking modern blues, which is nothing wrong with that, blues rock. But I don't think a lot of people my age or younger or older, when they hear blues, think of Magic Sam or Earl Hooker or all these guys that we listen to. So I liked leaning into it. I was like, well, it might be a harder hill to climb, but if we just, no one else is willing to do it, we'll do it, you know, and we'll just see how it goes. So, so far it's working. So, so I love the Hound Dog trailer, uh, Taylor tribute album. That was fantastic. Uh, do you think that something you might do again? Uh, do you have a, a Lightning Hopkins album in you or, or a Magic Sam album in you? Or? I doubt it. Uh, you never know. Like I said, I, I, anytime I have a really hard-ass opinion about something down the line, sometimes I change my mind. But that, that one, like I said, fell into our lap when Bruce contacted us. And it was between Bruce, us not being on the road, just finishing an all original album it was a fun project and uh i i like hound dog if you're into blues you probably know the name or maybe mm -hmm. you know who he is but it's not a household name and i love the idea that it was this guy that we have always loved and just making a tribute record about it's not like the i don't know it's not the home run right out of the gate like if you do a bb king tribute everyone knows who that is and in and, and theory people are going to probably buy it but I just like that idea, and I like I like that the instrumentation was the same: two guitars, drums, no bass. You know, um, so it just all worked out. It was a, a really fun project. I don't know; I, I doubt it, but you never. You, um, we'll do covers. I mean, we we always try to write our originals, but also revisit songs that we we loved, and and I think it makes you a better songwriter doing that. Mm, for sure. Well, you must have obviously learned a lot from Charlie over the years. Sure. What kinds of things has he uh, has he taught you? Uh, the biggest thing outside, I mean, obviously being on stage with Charlie, I, mean, I still play with him, so 14 years now. I mean, just you absorb playing with a guy like that with the history he he's had for his whole life, just playing with all these legendary people. Like, they're 
they're not even they're almost like not real life to me these guys like they're all they're all dead before i even started playing he was in bars hanging out with you know little walter muddy waters magic sam otis rush earl hooker freddie Bilo, hound dog um he always has a new story like we've traveled hundreds of thousands of miles at this point on planes and vans and he'll if i just bring up an old blues guy's name he, he'll have a story i haven't heard you know and it's pretty it's pretty amazing well you should be writing all these down yeah i, <laughs> I told he, he he threatens to do a book i keep telling him to write a book and i think i think he's he's talked to some writers about doing it but i don't know i, I hope he doesn't because he's got he's got the best stories Oh yeah, no kidding. Well, I'm, I'm and I'm sure you've got you know enough of your own from from working with with him and all the other people who come into his orbit. You know, sure. yeah. So, um, where was I going with this? I had a I had a question, but it vanished straight out of my. Well, head. It, happens, it happens to me all the time. Yeah, no worries. So, t- talking about having recorded this album back, you know, way back when. So, I'm guessing in a couple of years since, have you guys now written the next three albums already? Well, we have two more that are done. So yeah, we have, so Crackdown will come out and we have two more that are like finished, recorded, mixed, mastered, scheduled for release. Yeah. So we have well, that's more. gotta be, that's gotta be kind of uh, frustrating. No, I love it, man. It's freeing because it's, uh, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say frustrating. No, I, I wish I had another one. I wish I had three more because it just, right now we're still in like the building stage where we want to be out, you know, winning over new fans and playing in front of people live. I'm more a live band. So for me, I'm the one that produces these records. So we go in all rehearsing and writing and then actually recording it. But then when, when we were like, okay, that's done. Everybody goes home. I go to work with the engineer mixing the record and then Mm -hmm. getting it mastered and then doing all the stuff with the label. So it's nice for me to know for the next year and a half, I got two full length records after crackdown and we can just worry about touring, writing new stuff you know mm-hmm. we need some time to write some new stuff so it's kind of nice actually yeah I, I mean i get that but but musicians are always in love with their newest songs and and now yeah. you've got like uh, probably two dozen sitting there in the can that you you can't really come out and play right yeah we still play some of them we sneak them in oh okay you just don't tell people well, not all of them yeah well we sneak yeah. some of those in yep and so are the are the are the next two albums uh cut from the sort of same cloth or are you are you or do oh, you see yourselves progressing in a, in a way or how they're both totally different so I'll, I'll tell you about them uh the one that will be coming out after crackdown is just a live album so we recorded <laughs> it um in loveland in cincinnati at our our record label uh has a record store a brick and mortar store called plaid room records <laughs> it's this beautiful big vinyl record store and we did a concert there uh live to tape so direct to tape with a live audience so it's a mix of tunes, some new tunes, and then some tunes from these other records. So mm-hmm. there's that one, which will be fun, full length. And then the record after that is a fully acoustic record. So some new songs, and then some reinterpretations of covers, and some from our first two records, some from Hound Dog. Um, my idea behind that record was one of my favorite acoustic records. It's Folk Singer by Muddy Waters, where he okay. went in when you know the folk movement was going they thought you know they could rebrand him if he came into from a folk standpoint and he basically played a lot of his electric songs with a band on acoustics and that's kind of where we're coming from pat and i are not really acoustic blues guitarists we're electric players so we kind of came at it from that and there's some country stuff on there too so kind of cut to concept records more, more than like a brand new studio type deal you know gotcha I remember what I was going to ask you. You said you were you were still playing with Charlie. I mean, could, how do you how do you do that? How do you because I, I would think at this point GA twenty can basically be full time, sure. you know, all year long. So how do you work that out? Um, well, the pandemic. Charlie Charlie is it, with his band, like the Charlie Musselwhite band, is playing less since the pandemic has opened up. Uh, he's he just put out a solo record where it's him playing guitar. Mississippi Sun. Yep, good record. And then before that, he did a record with Elvin Bishop. So right. him and Elvin are doing gigs as like a duo or trio. So he's kind of busy with these other things. And his, the Charlie Musselwhite band, there's still gigs, but it's much slower than it was three years, you know, 2020 or before. So I'm able, luckily, uh, they're very uh, understanding and I'm, I'm, I'm able to juggle most of it. We also share a booking agent, which makes it easier. Uh, my booking agent is his agent. Um, but I have missed for the first time ever this year is the first time in, in 
14 or 15 years, the first year I've missed a few gigs, I had to get a sub. But he pretty much has his pick at the litter for guitarists. So he's fine if I'm not there at this point. Yeah. Yeah. But I just think it's great that you still want to do that, you know, because oh, yeah. a, a lot of people would go, well, you know, uh, love you, you know, thanks for everything. But now right. I've got this, 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 this full time gig right here. So, you know, if I can continue to play with Charlie, you know, and do GA20, uh, I'm happy to do both. Uh, okay. It's so nice. what's, uh, what's, uh, do you have uh, like uh, any long term? Plans for this, long-term goals, is or just kind of keep this going as long as you can. Oh, I have goals. Uh, Tell me about them. Share. Well, well <laughs> simply put, I, I mean, I want to see how far I can get get the band playing blues. Um, okay. Crossing over to people that might not listen to this style of music, and then discovering us or seeing us live, opening their mind to it. Maybe they go back and listen to church blues and, and become fans. Is what, like starting a blues revival, a traditional blues revival, or something like that. Um, and then, yeah, just get better slots at festivals, lots of touring. Like, I mean, I like, I love making records and I love going out and touring. So if we can continue to do that and grow and get bigger, but doing the music that we want, that's like the biggest goal, you know, mm. I, I never want to put a record out that I wouldn't want to listen to. Like, you know, I want to, if I make a record, I want to put it on and enjoy it. I don't want to make a record for, because I think I'm supposed to make something sound a certain way, you know? Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd like to think that you should be in the at least in the in the in the vicinity of a Grammy nomination for this one. That would that would be amazing. I mean, I don't know. I, we I know we we the label submits for that stuff, and uh, it would be amazing. But who knows? I don't know. I don't know. I kind of know how that stuff works, but who knows? I mean, hopefully, people like the record as much as we do. I can't. I can't see why they would not. Cool. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. All right. Well, listen. I think I've taken enough of your time today, and. Uh, I want thank to thank you. you for it and 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 for all the music. Well, thank you.